So, you've finished reading and studying and thinking about Act 4. Now's the time to think about all the different ways that this act is been shown on stage and on films over the years. So, in this video I'm going to whiz you through and show you screenshots from versions from 1979, 2004, 2006 and 2019. I'm going to pick, on, pick out those slightly unusual quirky moments, analyse them and show you how you can include them within an A-star, A-level essay. So stay tuned because you're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. Will. As usual, we're kicking off with Desmond Davis's 1979 BBC production of Measure for Measure. Act 4 starts with a sad love song, in which a spurned lover asks the unfaithful one to take his lips away because they were used to break promises, presumably, of love. The spurned lover also asks for the eyes to be removed. They offered so much, but ultimately lied to her. More ambivalently, she both wants her kisses returned to her i.e. to turn back time to a period before she lost her heart. But of course the phrasing also means that she wants a return to those glorious, happy, passionate moments. This production is faithful to the original play in that the song is sung by a boy rather than Mariana herself. One effect of this is to accentuate Mariana's passivity from the very word go. Even before she becomes a pawn in the Duke Isabella's machinations, albeit a willing one, she hasn't even got the agency or energy to rouse herself to sing her own love songs. Instead, she just sits. And on this particular occasion, she has sat in the same position all day, apparently, and thus can confirm that no one has been to ask after the Duke. Within the screenshot shown, you can see the Duke's hand on Mariana's sad looking face as he reassures her that he doesn't just believe her here, but constantly does so. This gesture from the Duke appears to be the act of someone who cares, who is on her side, who simply wants to help. Mariana may be concerningly passive for a modern audience's palette. But there are signs in this scene of Isabella taking on greater agency in relation to the Duke's plan. She invents her own reason for her supposed rendezvous with Angelo needing to be brief. She will have a servant waiting for her, whose persuasion is that she comes about her brother. And the framing shown on screen also seems to imply an improvement in the power dynamics. Isabella and the Duke seemingly of identical heights, are positioned symmetrically either side of Mariana, who is in the background within the shady, circular colonnade. At this point, at least, it is as though the two are equal co-conspirators, a partners working together to hit back against corruption and hypocrisy and to right wrongs. Other moments of interest in this production include the presentation of the prison, noisy with hands and feathers poking out of bars as the provost walks by with Pompey, confirming the general impression of Vienna as a place in which calm control and good order seems conspicuous by its absence both in and out of prison. There is also a comic contrast between the huge, serious, reticent Abhorsen and the wisecracking, non-stop talking, professed man of the world Pompey, shortly to be united as fellow executioners. In this production, Abhorsen makes it abundantly clear who is boss by showing Pompey his hangman's sword and then brushing it against the latter's right thumb, causing him to cry out in pain and to suck it to try to stop the bleeding. Whilst it is important not to read too much into individual moments, I wonder whether this act symbolises the fact that the only way to restore order and obedience within Vienna's garrulous, entertaining citizens is through coercion and punishment. Of course, both executioners and the Duke will fail miserably when it comes to carrying out the instructions to kill Barnardine. The non-compliant prisoner, famously labelled Sublime, and the comic genius of this authentically outrageous play by Harold Bloom. Unlike in a live stage production, where Barnardine is most likely to be based below the stage and therefore heard before C, in this interpretation, the reverse is true. 
with Barnardine being shown as the Provost talks about him in Act 4, Scene 2. This change results in a slight loss of comedy. The shouting of a pox on your throats, Barnardine's opening line in the play in Act 4, Scene 3, seems funnier to me if it comes out of the blue and we have never clapped our eyes upon the speaker. But it also increases the screen time of someone who is gloriously alone in not playing along to the Duke's tune of refusing to be manipulated or swayed for someone else's benefit. Now, that exam question. To what extent do we feel that the women in the play are dominated by the men? Given the amount of power wielded by the Duke in all five acts of the play, it would be tempting to agree wholeheartedly with the idea that the women in the play are dominated by the men, or at least one man. However, the truth may be more nuanced. For instance, Act 4 sees Isabella continuing to demonstrate comparatively impressive levels of agency, following her challenging of male authority and her insistence on bodily autonomy in earlier acts. As well as embellishing the Duke's plan with realistic sounding details, she will bring a servant with her to the late night rendezvous with Angelo. She is able to persuade Mariana extraordinarily quickly to participate within the bed swap plot within just six lines of text. The 1979 BBC production similarly aims to highlight Isabella's increasing confidence by presenting her symmetrically with the Duke while she explains exactly where the sexual encounter will take place. It is though the two are equal-ish co-conspirators working together to right wrongs and defeat corruption. However, this argument conveniently ignores the desperate passivity of Mariana, a woman who apparently does nothing apart from sit in the same place all day listening to soppy love songs, and who immediately concurs with the Duke's elaborate, morally problematic plan without saying a word. Indeed, the 1979 BBC production fails to follow the lead of other more recent interpretations, such as the 2004 production at the Globe, which at least give Mariana the agency of singing her own song. No such agency takes place here. And certainly, the overall presentation of Mariana contributes to a strong suggestion that the women in the play are overwhelmingly dominated by the men. Next, that 2004 production filmed at The Globe and broadcast live on BBC4. We have heard about this famous Mariana in Act 3, Scene 1, and have had to wait quite a while to clap our eyes on someone who should, in theory, intrigue an audience. She was once engaged to Angelo, yet no one apart from the Duke knew about her, with everyone else simply keen to dismiss Angelo as a cold fish with frozen pea. What is it about her that managed to ensnare, albeit temporarily, the currently frozen one? In this production, we are treated to almost immediate signs of her continuing violent and unruly love and despair following Angelo's rejection. Before any lines are spoken or sung, we see her crying whilst rereading lines within a book, perhaps love notes, perhaps her diary from happier times. So it is abundantly clear this is a devastated, wronged woman who, God damn it, will spring at any opportunity to get back with the man who discarded her so ruthlessly. By extension, the Duke has unquestionably done the right thing by her by engineering this implausible opportunity to re-ensnare Angelo. However, in this production, Mariana is composed and with it enough to be able to sing the opening song, which Shakespeare cast for a boy. She does it tunefully and reasonably well, and thus seems slightly less passive and helpless compared to the original text. She can gain some kind of sucker and wallowing pleasure from her own music making. That said, at the end of the song, she has to rush away after becoming emotional and only stays following the opportune arrival of the Duke. Perhaps the fact that she herself delivers a song about tragic betrayal in love in the first person has greater immediacy than listening to someone else who will be staging heartache in the first person rather than having directly experienced it. Given the intensity of the Angelo Isabella plots, comic characters such as Pompey, Lucio, and in a different way, Barnardine, 
are important for relieving tension and providing a broader insight into life in Vienna beyond the corridors of power. In the screenshot shown here, you can see a Horsen lifting Pompey clean into the air, as if to show his new number two, that the provost may claim that an executioner and a board are equally ignominious professions, but he has his pride and strength and is determined to exert his dominance over his cocky new assistants. And so a Horsen and Pompey's exchange provides amusement, as does, of course, Barnardine, who is initially heard not seen from below the stage, roaring that Pompey the rogue should go away. The reason he gives is deliciously comic. He is sleepy. The use of such a domestic everyday adjective contrasts sharply with the seriousness of a summoning for execution due to a murder charge, and so the audience cannot help but laugh. And when Barnardine does eventually pull his sleepy self up onto the stage, his appearance doesn't disappoint. He looks like a kind of crazed alcoholic hippie with his long straggly hair and silly hats. Note the sizable flask of presumably some strong spirits. Even better, his rebuttal is now aimed at the Duke, not just at Horson and Pompey, which increases the comedy. To see someone refusing the instructions of someone who has ultimate authority in Vienna, albeit currently undercover, is curiously satisfying particularly given the fact that the Duke is lying in a way which he wasn't when advising Claudio in Act 3, Scene 1. He is not there because of his charity, but because he needs Barnardine's head to be shaved and presented to Angelo as Claudio. And yet there is an urgency in the Duke's dealings with Barnardine, which to some extent could stem from a measure of genuine religious belief and shock at Barnardine's seeming total absence of Christian repentance or consciousness, as well as increasing panic at the probability that they would not be able to present a fake Claudio head to Angelo. Here we can see him kneeling on the floor, Bible outstretched, but Barnardine ain't having none of it. Another comic moment in this scene is the way the provost pops out Ragazine's severed head onto the stage, once again interrupting the flow of the Duke's machinations. In this production, lines 99 and 100 are cut, and there is a pause of a full 17 seconds, during which the Duke staggers back in shock, gags, and sits in a strange hanging position from which he is unable to see the severed head, before the provost in a patronising come reassuring tone reassures him that he will carry the head himself. Once again with this production, we are seeing that the Duke, in the guise as a friar, seems someone who can be talked over, someone who is apparently fragile and hapless, yet someone who is ultimately persuading everyone bar Barnardine to follow his instructions. He is also less successful with Lucio, but then he doesn't actually need him to follow his instructions. He just finds his insinuations disrespectful and bloody annoying. This production squeezes another comic moment out of the severed head, not in Shakespeare's original production. When the provost trots off towards an exit with Ragazine's severed head, with Isabella about to enter through the same door. The Duke goes berserk and frantically ushers the provost towards the other exit, whilst crying, no, 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 no causing great hilarity amongst the audience. But the timing of this strikes me as significant. Particularly keen students of the play will remember what the Duke says next. He confides in the audience that he will deliberately deceive Isabella, deliberately lie to her and tell her that Claudia has died after all. Why? It is to make her heavenly comforts of despair i.e. out of despair, she will learn the comforting power of heaven. This is such a strange, unconvincing reason, which furthers the impression we have of the Duke as someone who may enjoy stringing people along, may enjoy the drama of building up to an extraordinary climax in which everything is revealed, with himself as the grand hero and saviour. However, in this production, the audience is still laughing about the grossness of a man being ushered around the stage with a severed head in a bag, rather than thinking more seriously about this question. Just what the hell is the Duke up to? And why does he keep on itching his bloody feet? 
Now for an exam question. Is it true that the Duke seems to make things up as he goes along and that he is never far from disaster? The idea that the Duke seems permanently teetering on the verge of catastrophe and improvises haphazardly and hopefully strikes me as unfair and inaccurate. In relation to the former, a fairly obvious point is that he can choose to remove his disguise and resume power at any point, thus, for example, preventing injustices such as the death of Claudio. The fact is that he chooses to remain disguised and lurking behind the scenes, even when disaster appears imminent. This is part of his plan to satisfy his curiosity about Angelo, expose hypocrisy and corruption in the most public, dramatic way possible, and ensure that his former deputy is forced to accept the crazily loyal Mariana as his wife, poor Mariana disadvantaged. That said, there's no doubt that he needs to respond quickly to unexpected developments, including the fact that Angelo reneges on his side of the bargain by insisting on Claudio's execution, and Barnardine absolutely refuses to be put to death. However, his plan to present Barnardine's head as Claudio's is ingenious, and the logic behind the statement that death's a great disguiser is sound. No one likes to inspect a severed head too closely, something which is comically exploited in the 2004 Globe production when the Duke gags after seeing Ragazine's head plonked unceremoniously by him on stage. Yes, he benefits from the occasional timely dollop of love, luck, including the suspiciously convenient death of Ragazine. But overall, there is a sense that the Duke knows what he is doing. He has a plan, even if at times the audience feel uncomfortable with his underlying motivations, most notably his cruel decision to deceive Isabella about Claudio's death in Act 4, Scene 3. Let's return to the 2006 film version of the play, directed by Bob Kumar. Out of all the acts in the play, Act 4 probably contains the most number of cuts. Act 4, Scene 1 is cut entirely, partly because Mariana's acquiescence and participation in the bed swap plot has already been shown by flash forwards during the Duke's exchange and introduction of the plan in Act 3, Scene 1. In Act 4, Scene 2, there is no exchange between Pompey and a Porson or any mentioning of Barnardine. Act 4, Scenes 4 to 6 are cut entirely, and a bit of Act 4, Scene 3 is tagged within a section of Act 4, Scene 2. Here's how the screenplay looks for Act 4 in full. Press pause if you would like to read any of this in more detail. If watching in the classroom, you might want to analyse further the effect of any of the missing sections. The video will move within five second intervals between each slide. It is surely this line which is the most unsatisfactory within this version of Act 4. The Provost, having come up with the idea of substituting Claudio's head for Ragazine's, then suddenly and utterly unconvincingly gets cold feet and says that actually doing this would be against his oath. As you can tell from the annotations, the screenwriter has shifted from the happy death of Ragazine in Act 4, Scene 3 back to Act 4, Scene 2, when the Provost has still to be convinced that he should go against Angelo's instructions on the say-so of a mere friar. The trouble with this is that it seems bizarre that the Provost, having talked so eloquently of using Ragazine's head, then changes tack immediately and contradicts himself. That said, it does facilitate the disguised friar having to admit that he is actually much closer to the Duke than what might first appear, and it also reduces the Duke's agency. In this version, yes, he comes up with a whole elaborate plan of Mariana taking Isabella, Isabella's place in Angelo's pitch black bed, but he doesn't come up with the idea of switching heads. Does that make him slightly less of a control freak? Slightly less of a chess master, moving each piece precisely according to his whim? 
It's also important to note that in this production, the disguised friar goes further than whipping out the hand and seal of the Duke as shown within an official letter. Indeed, he doesn't do this at all. First, he dismissively screws up Angelo's instructions, confirming that Claudio should be executed by four of the clock. Before removing his blind man's sunglasses to show his eyes and real identity to the provost. The provost is so relieved and delighted that he gives the come home duke a hug in respectful joy and adoration. All hail the returning, all conquering hero, even though he never actually went away. And even though some of his pastimes would not be called particularly savoury. The fact that the Duke does categorically reveal his identity early in this production makes him seem more human, especially given the Proverse reaction, and less theatrical. In the original text, it seems as though he wants to control everything and wants to pick the exact moment both of his unveiling and his revelations about Claudio being alive. But here, the fact that he is happy to privately unveil himself to a panting provost, and the fact that his lines containing a feeble excuse about keeping Isabella ignorant of her good to make her heavenly comforts of despair are cut, makes him seem more relatable, more understandable, and less of a megalomaniac. Time for another one of my sample paragraphs, this time on the question as to whether the few good characters shine out in a dark, corrupt world. It is tempting to disagree wholeheartedly with both sides of this provocative statement. Firstly, is it really true to say that there are only a few good characters? In addition to the fairly straightforwardly decent Aeschylus, applies the law humanely, Claudio genuinely loves Juliet and Mariana, harmless as a fly, other characters also display regular selfless kindness. For instance, Lucio, in spite of his love of wisecracks and sexual innuendo, clearly feels genuine pity for Claudio. He would be sorry his life should be thus foolishly lost at a game of tic-tac. And he also plays a pivotal role in encouraging Isabella to be more passionate when pleading to Angelo for his life. Isabella may shock and surprise with the vehemence of her reaction following Claudio's suggestion that she might sleep with Angelo, but she always tries to do the right thing and openly declares that she would throw down her life but not her chastity for Claudio as frankly as a pin. And then there is Angelo and the Duke. Yes, Angelo is dark and corrupt in his attempts to get Isabella to yield her body to his will. But as Isabella herself points out, a due sincerity governed his deeds till he did look on me. As for the Duke, he is genuinely shocked by Angelo's hypocrisy and works tirelessly to help Isabella preserve her chastity albeit whilst continually delaying revealing his identity, which many audience members might have felt the more logical, straightforward means of resolving the situation. Of course, the extent to which we feel Vienna is a dark, corrupt world, or say, a vibrant, fun place in which sex and jokes are commonplace, will depend on the production. The 2006 Kumar film starts by showing widespread anarchy, drug taking, sex in toilets and flag burning. Given this production's elimination of the vibrant subplots, the vast majority of Pompey, Lucio and Elbow's lines are cut, this world initially does seem dark and corrupt. And yet other changes emphasise the good. The Duke, for instance, shows his human side by revealing his identity to the Provost in Act 4, resulting in a heartwarming hug. Now on to the RSC's 2019 production of the play. The opening song within Act 4, Scene 1 is not sung by a boy, as specified in Shakespeare's text, but a woman. This perhaps broadens the scope and points to the potential wider abandonment of women by men. It is not a one-off to find a man with eyes that do mislead the morn whilst... Mariana's passivity is stressed with her remaining seated and not moving throughout the song, even as the Duke enters. This is a woman who has been symbolically paralysed and transformed in the epitome of inertia following her rejection by Angelo. And by extension, this bed swap plot may end up benefiting her as much as anyone, in spite of initially seeming suspiciously convenient for both the Duke and Angelo. 
I wonder whether the replacing of the Duke's speech about the burdens and problems experienced by those in authority with an instrumental version of the Take O oh, Take Those Lips Away song also serves to retain a more compassionate focus on Mariana rather than the Duke's ego self-philosophizing. Instead of Mariana's acceptance just being taken for granted, the music and moving Darker Lightning indirectly remind us of her past suffering and allows this to take the stage rather than the Duke's self-obsessed, disguised, induced soliloquy. It is also amusing to watch the vigorous way Mariana marches towards the Duke post-conferring with Isabella and the nervous way the Duke pauses after saying, welcome. It seems a recognition of the delicacy of the request and that potentially Mariana might be furious with any man for making presumptions about her willingness to have sex. Other moments of interest in this production include the portrayal of Abhorsen. He seems somewhat crazed as he justifies his description of the hangman profession being a mystery in a strong Welsh accent. It's worth pointing out that the word mystery had multiple meanings during Shakespeare's time. As illustrated in these definitions taken from Shakespeare's words.com. Essentially, he is keen to stress that being a hangman is something deeper and more special and profound than any old profession. It requires great skill and very few people understand what the role is really about. However, his proof rather strangely talks about the fact that hangmen can benefit financially from the clothing of the person being executed. In this context, the thief represents the hangman who recognises the sell-on value of clothing that doesn't fit him. Of course, if it does fit him, then all the better. Abhorson's manic craziness results in Pompey sharing a God, what is this guy on? Look with the audience, resulting in an additional laugh. Abhorson's craziness is confirmed by the manic way he brandishes his hangman's axe in the air when instructing Pompey to bring Barnardine hither. With such a melodramatic, manic figure in charge of executions in Vienna, it is harder to take the whole notion of a death sentence too seriously. With this buffoon in charge, now aided by an opportunistic joker such as Pompey, it somehow seems unlikely that any prisoners will come to too much harm. Talking of Pompey, he also gets a laugh at the beginning of Act 4, Scene 3, when he self-consciously ad-libs and draws attention to his pun about peaches, which the modern audience is unlikely to fully understand. As confirmed by the ever-helpful Shakespeare'sWords.com, Peach can not just mean a colour or a fruit, but can also be used as a verb, similar to the verb we understand nowadays in peach. In this context, Mr. Caper has just ended up in jail due to his debt to Master Threepile, the fabrics merchant. The former was unable to pay for his four, four suits of peach-coloured satin, which denounces him, peaches him as a poor man, a beggar. With the audience likely to be rather confused by the barrage of allegorical type names such as Master Rash, Master Caper and Master Deepval, Pompey's unexpected metatheatrical departure from the script gives the audience something easy to laugh at and helps maintain the relaxed, slightly chaotic, bawdy feel of the prison. I previously referenced the silly, melodramatic way of Horson held his hangman's axe aloft. Well, here you can see the recalcitrant Barnardine mimicking the same motion whilst continuing his glorious non-cooperation with the authorities in relation to his life. In some ways, Barnardine just seems a more extreme version of Vienna in the way that so many seem to hold many of the laws and justice systems in contempt. Or, in the words of the Duke in Act 1, Scene 2, Liberty plucks justice by the nose and the baby beats the nurse. The fact that he can openly mock someone who you would suppose would be feared, if not necessarily respected, highlights the lack of good order and respectful morality under the Duke's reign, and hence the need for someone like Angelo. But this Barnardine doesn't just do mimicry. He does farting from his smelly, sweaty cell. 
and he can be violent too. Seen here with a threatening thug expression and his hand tightly grasping the Duke's cloak around the neck, having lost patience with the Duke's repeated insistence that he has to die that day and should prepare himself accordingly. I think one of the reasons Barnardine has become such a cult figure within Shakespeare, in spite of, or perhaps because of, his comparative lack of lines, is because he just doesn't give a shit. Whoever he is talking to, whatever their status, he couldn't give a damn. And in most productions, you would imagine the Duke to be pretty put out by this, as he is here. Released from Barnardine's grip, and with the latter safely back down in his cell, he shows his frustration by impotently shouting his comment about Barnardine having a gravel heart as a direct insult, rather than a saddened or shocked observation, down into his pit. As with other interpretations, notably the Globe 2004 production, some fun is had with Ragazine's head. Here you can see it squirting liquid into the Duke's right ear, causing him to emit a loud ah, and the audience to laugh at the grotesqueness of it all. But as you might expect, having seen her spasms in act two, It is Isabella's reaction to the supposed death of Claudio, which provides one of the dramatic highlights of this act. She moves around the stage increasingly haphazardly before running to the front, ripping off her nun's headdress and kneeling down to beat her chest furiously and cry out her famous exclamations, unhappy Claudio, wretched Isabel, injurious world, most damned Angelo. She then seems to have some kind of fit falling further to the ground with her mouth wide open and four fingers disturbing the insides. The Duke quietly shushes Isabella, manages to lift her upper body from the floor before cradling her. His voice is aimed to be soothing and reassuring. With the Duke returning the next day, there is a chance, if not for all to be put right, after all, Claudio is apparently dead, but for justice to be served. Isabella is calmer by the end of the scene, but her reaction both to Angelo's manhandling in Act 2 and her fit here raise important questions about her mental state. Are these reactions simply the natural consequence of appalling once-in-a-lifetime circumstances? Or do they suggest greater underlying vulnerabilities, thus making the Duke's proposals towards the end of Act 5 all the more unpalatable? A funny play. Do you agree? Here's my response, which references the RSC production. It can be tempting to focus on the intense, tense scenes which stem from Angelo's attempt to sleep with Isabella and conclude that Measure for Measure is predominantly a serious drama, to use modern parlance, than a comedy. And yes, we are gripped whilst observing Isabella as she finally realises Angelo's intent. And yes, the confrontation between Claudio and Isabella in Act 3, Scene 1 stuns and appalls in equal measure as sister turns on brother with extraordinary vituperation. But it would be wrong to focus slow, solely on these scenes, as there is no doubt that the play includes some extremely funny moments, particularly on stage, as opposed to just being read within a text as directors continually wrestle with how to get around the fact that modern audiences may not fully understand some of the language. In Act 4, for instance, there is the spectacle of state executioner Abhorsen claiming his brutal profession is a mystery, and audiences, audiences laugh for any notion of aggrandizing such a hideous job, particularly when, in the RSC production of 2019, Abhorsen is a manic Welshman prone to waving his hangman axe around in the air at regular intervals. Barnardine, famously labelled a comic genius by Harold Bloom, is another character from Act 4 who invariably gets numerous laughs. We laugh at the discrepancy between his perilous situation, his execution has been imminent for some time, and his glorious rowdy disdain, seen in his labelling those who try to bring him to the gallows as rogues. It is particularly satisfying and amusing that he completely blanks the otherwise all-conquering Duke, 
Modern audiences in particular may feel uncomfortable with the amount of power he wields, and so are delighted when, for a change, he doesn't manage to get his way and secure his head. The RSC 2019 production makes Barnardine's rejection of the Duke even more amusing. The former gives the latter a much needed throttling, indicating that moments of violence can temporarily triumph against endless machinations and secretly held power. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, taking you through four different interpretations, measure for measure, and helping you get that ace.